good morning everybody uh, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today dr fang fan uh, dr fan is uh, uh, actually a, a endowed professor of pathology and a director of cytopathology at the university of kansas medical center uh, she did her uh, md from university of shanghai came to us uh, did her uh, phd uh, residency in pathology and her fellowship in cytopathology from University of Kansas Medical Center. Uh, her primary specialty is uh, cytopathology and she is uh, author uh, of several uh, books and one of her books, Cytopathology Reviews, which uh, the fellows um, and the resident would know is one of the top sellers on pathology outlines. Uh, the topic of her talk, however, today is not uh, related to cytopathology, but but to breast pathology, which is another area of ex of her uh, is another area of her expertise. Uh, KU actually has a fairly uh, big uh, breast cancer uh, uh, group with over six surgeons and several oncologists and uh, radiologists, and uh, have a very robust uh, breast cancer research program. Um, and I, I can actually tell you from my experience being over there, uh, being a fellow and. Uh, uh, a resident and having presented at many of the breast conferences, that Dr. Fan would be the go-to person whenever we had any difficult breast cancer case. <coughs> and she was highly regarded by the oncologists and the breast surgeons uh, who would just demand uh, to have some of their more complex cases to be read by Dr. Fan. So with this introduction, I would like to welcome Dr. Fan and let her start her talk. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Harlit, for the nice introduction. And I, I you know, came to uh, Minneapolis in December. Everybody says, oh, you are brave. But I'm coming here, it was like a sunny and beautiful and warm. I'm really happy. This is my first time at uh, University of Minnesota. I've heard so many good things about this place. It's really beautiful here. Thank you. So the, the title of my talk today is Evaluating and Reporting Breast Cancer After Neoadjuvant Therapy, uh, Generating a Meaningful Pathology Report. In throughout the, uh, the talk, you know, I basically share how we, um, you know, uh, handle those specimens and also as a collaborator uh, uh, for our research group, I also share my experience how we contribute to, to the to research. And here is the outline of my talk and first a brief introduction. And due to advancement in medicine and science, we now have a better understanding of disease. Um, breast cancer, you know, if you are interested in history, there's it's a very interesting history about breast cancer understanding and treatment. And in 19, early 1920s, it, you know, breast cancer is considered a local regional disease. And the famous breast surgeon, Dr. Hostad at Johns Hopkins, you know, he believes, actually at that time, the belief is that, you know, breast cancer is a local regional disease. It would spread to other parts of the body step by step. And so, so that's why he believes if I take out the whole breast, including the axilla, you know, we would stop the spread of breast cancer to other places. So, so he, you know, um, developed the Hostad surgeries, which is so-called a radical mastectomy, including remove the breast tissue, the pectoralis muscle, the whole axillary contents. So it's a hu <coughs> huge disfiguring surgery. However, the, the breast cancer survival did not improve you know, he does follow up, uh, you know, with his patients and he didn't see an improvement of survival and he thought, well, the surgery must not be radical enough. So, so it, you know, went far and beyond. And that kind of error lasted 50, even 70 years. And then in early 1980s and or late 70s, there was a, a young breast surgeon at uh, Pittsburgh, um, Bernard Fisher. He and he, actually his brother uh, was a pathologist at Pittsburgh. He, he started to think, you know, maybe, maybe that's not how breast cancer uh, spread. And uh, it's, it's instead of being a local regional disease, breast cancer indeed is a systemic disease. Once it's an invasive cancer, it has access to, to systemic circulation. It's there. It's out there. It doesn't follow the step-by-step -step thing. And uh, he did, and that also was the beginning of evidence-based medicine, you know, did clinical trials and show that uh, compared to, 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 to mastectomy, you know, mastectomy doesn't really have survival advantage over lumpectomy. You know, if you get the tumor out with radiation, get good local control, it's really the adjuvant, adjuvant chemotherapy, the systemic therapy improved the survival. So, so now, I mean, no, I don't think the young surgeons even know how to do those radical uh, mastectomies. It's, it's not never, because it's really not, you, you get a good, 
lumpectomy, a uh, good margin with radiation, the, the, the survival is the same as, as, as a, a mastectomy. And also axillary lymph node dissection is not a therapeutic procedure, it's more of a staging procedure. That's why we're doing less and less with axilla now. And we also have more treatment options now and uh, with systemic therapy, not just conventional chemo, we have targeted therapy, you know, anti-hormonal and HER2 uh, uh, targeted therapy. And now on the rising is the immunotherapy. I'll talk a little bit about that as well. So pathologist's role change, evolve, you know, throughout this process before, it doesn't matter whatever cancer, you call it breast cancer because there is not many treatment treatment options. When we were uh, re renovating our old library, I pulled some old report from, from 1970s. A breast cancer report was just a couple of lines. But now it's like a couple of pages, right? You can't just say it's cancer. You have to give all the other information because, because this, those are all very useful uh, clinical information. So traditionally, you take out the cancer, then you give adjuvant chemotherapy. And now, new adjuvant chemotherapy, you give the chemotherapy first, then you do the surgery. And this was first discovered with those local, locally advanced breast cancer when they are inoperable. They are inoperable, so the, the, you know, the uh, oncologist gives them chemo, then they realized some cancer actually shrunk and then became operable. Then they were like, maybe, we, you know, what, what if we try this on this, all those early stage operable, stage one and two breast cancers? And uh, would it be better to maybe give chemotherapy before surgery, or is it better, you know, do the surgery and give the chemotherapy afterwards? Again, evidence-based medicine, you need a clinical trial to decide the end point uh, is survival. And there were now up at the time, there are two large uh, uh, trials, an NABP uh, trial uh, in the United States, and there was a big European trial. And uh, now, there are more than 20, probably, uh, new adjuvant trial. All of them showed, actually, it doesn't matter if you <coughs> give chemo before or after surgery, the survival were equivalent. And uh, so, so it really doesn't matter. And uh, so now, you know, new adjuvant, you can, if you think the patient needs adjuvant, uh, therapy, you can all offer it neoadjuvantly. So then why do we do neoadjuvant? Th there are advantages. First, it improves surgical options. So they may make the surgery, you know, they may shrink the tumor and make the surgery uh, 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 much smaller lumpectomy instead of mastectomy, you know, or large lumpectomy. And more importantly, you know, and the oncologist, you can, you can tell, it, it, it's amazing, you give chemo, and you can actually see if the tumor responds or not. So the response to neoadjuvant is a predictor of long-term outcome. And uh, this is a very nice paper uh, published uh, at the end of 2014. And they basically just, just went PubMed search and they obtained those published data from 20, uh, 12 international uh, neoadjuvant clinical trials and included this many uh, patients and then they analyzed the, the data and they clearly showed if, so the, the end point again is event-free survival and overall survival. The red line uh, is the, when the patient had complete response, complete res uh, when had a complete pathological response. You can see it's a very powerful predictor of survival. In, in other words, and when a patient received neoadjuvant chemotherapy, if, if she responded really well, you can you know, it's a very strong prognostic marker. You can tell her she's going to do really well. Instead, if you do the surgery first, then give the chemo, you basically, you really don't, you know, you, there are no, I'll talk a little bit about the predictors of to neoadjuvant chemotherapy. There are no really strong uh, predictors. And also it's a very, uh, uh, have research advantages. Uh, you know, our, our researchers love, love this, this. It allow, um, allows rapid assessment of new therapeutic agents. You know, one big obstacle to, to develop new uh, cancer therapy uh, drug is, takes forever, you know, for all the approvals. So with new adjuvant, you can quickly uh, develop new therapy and test its effectiveness. And I know University of Kansas and the University of Minnesota are, are involved in the iSpy2. Uh, it's a phase two, uh, phase three <coughs> clinical trial testing new therapeutic agents, new adjuvantly, because you have the have the cancer in front of you. You you know you can test new drugs, 
and it's a very valuable research tool. You can, Im can you imagine you have the cancer pre-treatment, so you have all the information there, then, then you know, post-treatment, so you can really do a lot of, lot of things with those data. So pre-treatment, you know, we do, you do a core needle biopsy, you must make an invasive diagnosis, and uh, since up to a third, you know, 15, 20, up to 30 percent of patients will have a complete response. So, so sometimes this is the only tumor tissue you will have on the patient. So this is a valuable material to collect. So there are several ways uh, to do it if, if you have, you know, uh, interested. One way we do it at KU is that the, you, you know, the radiologist can always collect an extra call. Uh, you know, you do the patient consent. With patient, I think if you, if you tell them, you talk to them, they're always, they're always willing to, to donate their tissue. So, so the radiologist can collect an extra <coughs> call for the p tissue bank. Another thing is in the pathologist's end, you know, we have a, a <coughs> specific breast cancer kind of wreck. And where the radiologist write, you know, it's BioRed 5. BioRed 5 almost always is cancer. And even if it's two or three calls, we put it in two blocks. And you know you can easily put it in one block, but put it in two blocks. So one block we use for diagnosis, immunos, ERPR, HER2. The other block in you know in the future, if if you know actually all our new adjuvant pretreatment calls are probably used for various trials and research. So and we actually do the same for tiny lung biopsies. We always divide them, put them in two two blocks because one you use for your regular routine <coughs> IHC, the other one you can save for EGFR and because we have to keep that in mind, the tissue is getting smaller and they want more, more and more from us. So, so that's now our protocol and it's really improved tremendously and you know to divide the little course into two and always you know give those information, that's, that's routine. And the, then, then, then you got an invasive cancer diagnosis. The patient is doing new adjuvant therapy, and then you monitor the, the treatment response. And the, you know there are radiology reports saying the, the MRI is really good in monitoring uh, the, the treatment response. You can see the tumor shrink and all that. But it's it's general. It's consensus that pathologic assessment is the gold standard. So we are the one to determine if the patient had a complete response, or if there are residual tumor. And uh, I showed already the the, <coughs> the complete response. The PCR is a very strong prognostic uh, indicator for for survival and all that. And but if you have residual cancer, the quantity and the amount of residual cancer also correlates with. The, the local recurrence and all that. So every information is very helpful. So what is PCR? What's the definition of complete response? And this is a very recent article in Modern Pathology talking about new adjuvant and all that. So there are several definitions throughout in all the clinical trials. And uh, this is the one we use at Universal Cancers and this apparently is used most often is that you don't have invasive cancer in breast and axilla, uh, but you, DCIS is allowed. So that's, uh, this is the, the most used uh, definition. And there are others uh, not, not even allow DCIS, and there are others don't you know, include the lymph node. And so I, I'm not sure what, uh, which uh, criteria you use here. And this is that Lancet pa paper, remember, they evaluated 11 um, uh, trials. And there are you know, all these criteria. So in that article, they also think, propose that pathologic complete response is defined as either PT0 slash IS in situ and N0 or T0, N0. But, <coughs> but as they show here, that T, uh, if you include in situ or not the top two lines, there are no difference. So, so re really <coughs> residual in situ or, or not, it didn't really change the survival. And so if you use the T0, N0, it's more stringent. stringent. So again, I think uh, the more, um, more and more commonly used criteria for PCR or complete response is no invasive cancer in breast and, and lymph node. And if you have DCIS left in the breast, that's con still considered a complete response. And then now we're going to go to the part of you know, how we evaluate those breast specimens. And I'm t uh, telling all the residents here that uh, we evaluate the breast is the same. You know, 
with or without treatment. And the important thing is to do it standard in a standardized way. We have PAs and residents, every, before they go do the breast, we always tell them this is how we do it. And if we do it every time the same, it's, it's really not that, that hard. So for the new adjuvant, and before you, 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 you know, you hopefully they tell you the patient has had new adjuvant therapy, and we told the residents, you flip the paper, if the biopsy was done four to six months ago, and now it's the surgery, more likely the patient has had some therapy, of course you need to confirm that. And then always check the radiology report. What, you know, before you gross any lumpectomy or mastectomy, with or without neoadjuvant treatment, you got to have uh, the radiology report. You know how many lesions or where are the lesions. And uh, after neoadjuvant, you have to identify the tumor bed, where the tumor was. It's, it's <coughs> imperative you have to identify the tumor bed. And the tumor bed is not always easy, especially now a lot of patients have complete response. It's not always easy. So this is how, you know, a tumor look like. It's very greedy and, um, and stellate and firm. This is how a tumor bed look like. It's kind of vague, fibrotic area. There are some hemorrhage probably still from the previous, previous biopsy and it's, it's also, it can be vague. And uh, again, this is how tumor bed look like. It's kind of just a large fibrotic area. And we, we know this area from the radiology, from the previous biopsy clip. And sometimes they have a little bit of residual cancer. You can tell this kind of little bit of fleshy, um, viable tumor area. And uh, it's, it can be really hard. And so you need, you, I mean, I'm sure it's here also, whenever the radiologist does a biopsy, leave a clip behind. So, so we have a Fexitron in our growth room so that, you know, we, 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 we if you cannot grossly identify a tumor bed like I show, you, you actually the specimen, you find the clip. That's where the tumor was. And you know, our surgeon always think we mess, mess up their margins. You know, we have very high maintenance, high demand. We have six breast surgeons, they do nothing but breast. So they are really attached. So they think we always mess up their lumpectomy margins. So they decided they bought their own ink. These are sterile ink and they ink the lumpectomy. And we're like, fine, you know, <laughs> less, work, less work for us. So, so all our lumpectomy come down like this. Oh. So it's, it's a wide look, they inked it, and if some, sometimes they still mess up, then they blame their own surgery resident, you know. <laughs> that's, you know that's what I said. And so it comes in the standard color with Y look. We also do seed look. Uh, uh, I don't know if you do seed localized lumpectomy. So, so we get a specimen like this, and then we, we do a Fexitron and uh, identify the clip there. And then and sometimes this is a different specimen. We have this one has two seeds, you know, radioactive seeds, and then two clips. So we identify all those. And those, you, you know, once we scan in, we t uh, tell the radiologist, and the surgeon also can see it in their room, and the radiologist would also call up to the room, in, to the surgeon. Then we, we slice them, and then we submit, this is for all the resin, we submit our lumpectomy by slices. So, you know, you submit, you, you, you slice from medial to lateral, the most medial goes to cassette number one, the most lateral goes to, you know, so you submit by slice, and then we do another x-ray. This one, the tumor bed seems to be extending to certain margins, that's medial, that's lateral, anterior, deep, superficial, uh, superior and inferior. And uh, this one seems not having, you know, too many um, residual tumor. And then when we gross, we say that um, a biopsy clip is, uh, is present in slice number four and slice number six. And, uh, you know, a, a seed is, you know, in whichever slice. So it's by slice. And then you submit them. And you also submit by slice because that helps us later on under microscope. So you say slice one in cassette one slice two in A2 and A3. We always do it from superior into inferior, you know, this way. And uh, so slice three is in A4 to A7. That way you know those four, you know, from one slice. That really helps. So, you know, if the specimen is not large, you just submit it all sequentially by slice. That way under microscope you can put them back together. If it is too big, you know, it's a big lumpectomy, big tumor bed, there are guidelines. You basically, you submit um, 
one slice per one centimeter. So, so for example, if the tumor bed is five centimeter, you would su submit five complete slices. Each slice may be four cassettes, so it's 20 blocks. So something like, so it's always like that. And uh, so that's no problem. You know, y in breast, people tend to oversubmit. It's not, you know, it's across the board in all academic centers. You kind of, especially if you don't see residual tumor, you're going to call it a complete <coughs> response. You really want to make sure. So usually we go back and submit more. So people tend to oversubmit the tumor bed. And the problem is, happens is when you have a large tumor, you really grossly don't see a tumor bed. That's when you really need to submit ex you know, a generous area around the previous biopsy clip. And, uh, and then, then you, you, you really need to do it and when you feel comfortable, <coughs> you have you know, sampled the, the specimen well. And the mastectomy is the same. <coughs> and you, if you identify the tumor bed, you submit it sequentially. You know, you say the medial slice, the, the middle slice, the lateral slice, and each slice has, you know, can have two to four blocks or whatever. So you do it sequentially. And again, if you don't identify a tumor bed and you need to x-ray the mastectomy, you submit around the, the, the clip. So this is a mastectomy. I, we don't paint our whole mastectomy black, you know, you can, but for, 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 for me, it's just harder if you ink it, then you slice, then this black ink everywhere is very difficult. And, you know, the surgeon don't ink the mastectomy for us because, uh, you know, it's out. So, so what we do is we do nice thin slice, then you see a lesion, then we would e just ink it around the lesion. That way, you know, it's not too messy. And then here, you know, we see a previous <coughs> tumor bed area and then you chop the whole slice. That's what I mean by slice. So this one, we would submit this slice. This is not much. So we probably would submit the whole entire tumor bed sequentially by slice. So by slice, you, I tell the residents, you just chop up this whole area like this, and then you put it in three cassettes. So you put it, you, so you say this to this, to, you, you know, is one slice, one most medial slice and whatever. And this way later on it's so much easier to put it together. So here is what you, I told you how we, we help collect tissue in pre-biopsy, uh, pre-treatment biopsy. This is when you can help because the, the researchers and uh, clinical trials, they would like this tissue when you have a little bit, you know, tumor bed, maybe tumor, or maybe not. So what you do is that, you know, after I put it in cassette, I shave. Because even this tissue in this cassette, you're never really going to see the whole thing, right? You're only going to see one level of it. The, there's so much of it, it will be left there, you know, n n untouched anyway. So I just shave a little sleeve you know, of, of the specimen I gave it to, to research, to tissue bank, to whatever. And it's really, doesn't really affect your clinical um, diagnosis or anything. So, so because re they really need tissue, you know, to, to do all this, all this uh, research. Sometimes with mastectomy, you don't see a tumor bed, it's really going to, to be troublesome. Sometimes we really chop it and find the clip, and then we submit the whole clip uh, area around the clip, and we still identify a uh, tumor. So it's really important. You've got to feel comfortable. You, you, you identified the tumor bed or the previous biopsy uh, tumor area. So grossly, you give all this measurement, and that's, that's common sense. And the microscopically, so how does the tumor bed look like? You know, it, ha it ha have hyalinized stroma, you have fibroelastosis, you have those lymphocytes, histocytes, and hemosiderate. So this is how those tumor bed look like uh, microscopically. You have this fibrotic area, and this is those fibroelastosis. When you see this, you knew tumor was here before, and it is gone now, it's gone. And you know, the calcification stays, and uh, Sometimes you have a large area of a lot of hemosiderin uh, laden macrophages. So this is a you know, lot of edema. This is tumor bed. So tumor was here before. And uh, the in residual invasive uh, cancer, mostly they don't change in morphology. Some will. And sometimes you will need help of keratin. Sometimes you can tell if this is a macrophage or residual cancer. So you need to do pancytokeratin or myoepithelial markers to, to help. So this is, uh, of course, you would compare to the pre-treatment uh, uh, biopsy uh, tumor. And this one, um, I didn't show the, it, just from it, you know there's not much cellularity change. So this one shows minimal treatment effect. This one has some treatment effect. You can see the fibrotic area, this fibroelastosis. Um, so this showed partial treatment effect. 
And then sometimes they have very um, uh, marked uh, retraction artifact. This tumor actually have uh, treatment effects. This is like what we say in cytology when you have vacuolization of the cytoplasm as a nuclei and the tumor cells become large and these are treatment effects in the tumor cells. And sometimes you, you, you know, this is uh, uh, within a duct. And what about this one? Is this a residual DCIS or is this a residual invasive cancer? Because if it's just residual DCIS, it's considered a complete response. We don't really care, you know, because DCIS doesn't really go anywhere. Uh, <coughs> but if it's a residual invasive cancer, that, that's, that's important. So you do your uh, myoepithelial marker, and it doesn't have myoepithelial marker, so that indeed is a residual invasive cancer. Because this, is, this information is so important clinically, we need to you know, make it, get it clear. I always tell the residents and fellows, all tumor bed need a high power examination. So this looks like not much. And, uh, but you go on, you know, you look, there are some cells kind of hang around here, this, and, you know, here and there. Those could be histiocytes and could be tumor cells, you know, these cells there. So always look uh, hi uh, high power, even, even the low power look like um, inflammatory cells, histiocytes. And then you do a keratin, <coughs> indeed, those are keratin positive, those are residual tumor cells. Again, you know, it makes a huge difference because if there are, you know, patient will get additional therapy when there are residual cancer. And uh, this is another picture of residual, uh, you know, are this, are this just residual, um, you know, this lobules or, you know, is this in situ lesion or invasive lesion, you know, it's, it's not clear uh, sometimes. So you do your stain, you do your keratin, you do your SMM, and you actually can see those uh, cells without uh, smooth muscle myosin around them. So those are indeed invasive cancer. You see the little c clusters, they don't have the myoepithelial layer around them. And uh, there are occasional uh, situations where you have the tumor bed, but you don't have <coughs> parenchymal lesions. All tumors are in the lymphovascular channels. And we have, have seen that. And there was a, 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 a small study published in the American Journal of Search Pass. They actually said this carry an adverse prognostic significance. And the, pr the thing is, how do you stage this? You know, they are, it's not T0 because they are there, but they are not in the parenchymal. So we usually just give a TX. We really don't know how to stage this because these are extensively in the vascular space, lymphatic channels. So, so sometimes your normal breast tissue would also show changes uh, after neoadjuvant therapy. Again, not always. And you need to able, be able to recognize those and not cause those cancer. And a lot of times they show this intra-lobular um, hyalinization. That's very easy to, to recognize. Sometimes the cells look kind of a, very, with a smudged nuclei, a little bit hobnailing. And that's, again, it's, this is not DCIS. These are treatment effect. And, uh, you, you know, again, it's, if, if there are times you really cannot tell, you want to call it residual DCIS, and you're not sure if it's a residual DCIS or if it's just benign duct lobby with marked really, uh, treatment effect, it, it's okay because, again, residual DCIS doesn't, you know, it's, it's still count as complete response. So, so when, you, when you look at it, everything's good. That's only, you know, only the beginning because the next thing is, you know, all pathologists dread is you have to measure it. You know, the size, the cellularity, the margins, and all that uh, stuff. So how do you measure it? So, so, so after neoadjuvant treatment, um, you know, complete response, no problem. As long as I feel comfortable, I sample it well, and I looked under high microscopic fields and no residual cancer, everybody's happy. And this would be fine too if it is shrink concentrically, you know, so this is a residual tumor, it's fine. But most commonly, the tumor actually responds in this way. It's kind of scattered in your tumor bed here or there. So, so what do we do? And uh, so you, when you measure it, you, 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 give, you give the extent. Then you also tell them the single largest contiguous focus. And uh, so, so sometimes, you know, a report will be like this, this, multiple foci of cancer over a 4CM fibrotic tumor bed, the largest contiguous focus is this. And, uh, and a lot of times because th th there's change in cellularity and people think the change in cellularity is more important than the size. So you got to mention the cellularity in your, in your report. 
And so this is no problem. So this is when you, so this is how, you know, that's, remember I said we, we, we submit sequentially, we, we submit it by slice. So this is A1, A2, A3, A4 is from one slice. And uh, so this is what we give on each, all the, after treatment, we give them, th them the dimension of B and C. That's the tumor bed extent. Then we give them the measurement of D, which is the largest contiguous focus. Then we give them a, a cellularity. So all these three things, you, you got to put it in your, your path report. And uh, there are, this was in 2009. You can imagine there are, here there are six reporting systems, how to grade those response. And now I think there are more than 10 systems how to grade the treatment response. And the most commonly used, we use, you, you use the, a, we use the AJCC TNM. And then almost most of the clinical trials use RCB system. So that's, those are the two I'm going to briefly talk about. Let's see the time. Okay. So, so you use, uh, when you use a TNM system, how do they know this is after treatment? You use a little Y. And uh, so if you, if this is a TNM, uh, this is a TNM and the seventh edition. So if you have multiple nests of residual tumor, you use the largest contiguous focus for your T staging. So apparently people have been criticizing this because they think you understage the patient because, you know, it could be a four cent, uh, four centimeter area, but your only, the largest focus could just be one cm. So instead of, you know, calling it a T2, you're calling it a T1B, you know. So, so, so it could be significant. And also the TNM does not include changes in cellularity in the system. And so the RCB system, this is developed by MD Anderson. That's what's used in the iSpy trial. And it's a very complicated mathematic formula. And you can, it's free, you can get on the uh, website. And we don't calculate the RCB in our pathology report, but we put all the necessary information in our report. So whoever does the clinical trial or research, they can calculate. It's, I mean, I honestly don't know how they put up such a, it has exponential things. I mean, I don't know how they come up with such a very <laughs> complicated, we have a, a old uh, senior pathologist. He said once the, the pathology becomes like a mass, you know, everything is millimeter. You know, it's like, that's not what, they used to practice pathology, but you know, so so this as a important this you have to have all of this for them to calculate RCB. So if you participate in clinical trials, it's best to just put those in there. Otherwise, they'll call you. Oh, I need this. Then you have to go back to the cases. More work. So you give them the residual tumor bed size. Remember the the B uh, the B and C, and then you give them the cellularity, and then you give them the percentage. Of cancer that is DCIS because the DCIS doesn't count and then number of positive lymph nodes and then diameter of largest metastasis so these are the things you you include anyway in your thing so we include all of those and then when all you done with the tumor and then you still have to tell them about the margins right and uh, so far, especially for lumpectomy, you know, the residents always say, do, do you like lumpectomy or, or mastectomy? Lumpectomy, lumpectomy is easier to gross because usually they're small, you just slice them, you submit it all. But lumpectomy is harder for microscopic evaluation because you have to tell, you know, give six margins. And mastectomy is, you know, grossing is harder because sometimes you know, there are so many multifocal, multicentric tumors, but usually margin is easier to assess because, you know, the whole breast is out. And um, so the significance of tumor bed at the margin is uncertain, especially in patients with pathologic complete response. This refers to lumpectomy. You know, you have a tumor bed. It, it's, you know, one of the ra uh, radiology graph I showed earlier. <coughs> that mm -hmm. the tumor bed extends to margin and there's actually no tumor left and uh, it's uncertain the guideline is not out yet if the if the surgeon should go back to take more or not and uh, sometimes there's not sufficient residual tumor to grade but you know at least give the nuclear grade and uh, you know the markers usually don't change after treatment, but not always. And again, there's no guideline if you should re always repeat them or not. And I mean, our clinicians always want them to be repeated. I don't know if that's the case here. So we always just, just repeat them. We have done a study and uh, compare the pre and the post treatment, and most of them don't change. 
And uh, so it's so hard to remember all those things. So we just, uh, KU, we just generated our own checklist for, for breast after new adjuvant. <coughs> so we just have all these things in here, so you won't forget to put them in. Again, because we participated in so many trials and the research, it's, it's good to always have the same thing in the report. So tumor bed identified, size, extent of tumor bed, extent of residual tumor, and overall cellularity. So really it's not. And then we, after that, we give an overall response to treatment. In the breast, is it no minimum partial or complete? That's more of a subjective uh, assessment. And so now, uh, what about the lymph nodes? And uh, so I in the past, patients have clinically negative actually lymph nodes before NACT. They do, a, you know, they you do sentinel node biopsy uh, after the treatment, you know, when you do the primary breast surgery. And previously, when the patient had a positive actually node before new adjuvant treatment, and then they would automatically after treatment or automatically get an axillary node dissection. Then there was alliance trial, and I was involved in that alliance <coughs> trial. I think the data just came out. And now even, even if the patient had a positive axillary node before a uh, new adjuvant treatment, now they can also attempt a sentinel node first instead of just go ahead and do a whole axillary node dissection. As I said before, now we know axillary node dissection is not therapeutic. It doesn't improve survival or anything. It's a more of a staging procedure. It does control, you know, it does contribute <coughs> to local, local regional control for, you know, for recurrence. So now, you know, we just do less and less now because we, we understand the, the disease uh, process better. And the lymph node, we all know that after new adjuvant chemotherapy, sometimes the lymph node will complete, have complete depletion of the lymphocytes. So it's difficult to, to recognize these, these, these shrunk and, and all that. And the lymph node number is always a big deal for our surgeons. You know, if you only have, we say, you know, minimum of 12. Mm -hmm. And if you only have 10 nodes, it's best to just go back and submit more or cut deeper or do whatever. Instead of getting a phone call from, from the breast surgeon, you still have to do all that because they just, you know, it's just very important, you know, to get certain num number of nodes so they can assure they did a good uh, job of staging the patient. And uh, so, so sometimes they say you submit all fibrotic areas in the fat and around the vessels. And so when you evaluate those nodes, you, you might have positive nodes without treatment effect. You might have positive node with treatment effect. And if you, even if you have positive node, but it shows treatment effect, this has better disease-free survival and lower relapse rates. So all these are important to mention in your path reports. And you might also have negative node with treatment <coughs> e effect. So we mention all of this in our report because this indicates a complete response. That's a good thing. And then you have negative node without treatment effect. So this is a negative node and showing a tumor bed here and you know, then showing a tumor bed here, there used to be tumor here, but now it's all gone. So you got to mention I have you know, total 12 nodes and two nodes, two negative nodes show treatment effect. And then here is a lymph node. You know, maybe there's something that's kind of pale here and it could be histiocytes and, and all that. And you know, use your cytokeratin and there's nothing wrong with it. And it shows a tremendous tremendous residual tumor in the lymph node. So this is a, 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 a not a good prognostic uh, uh, image in there. And this is a positive node and shows some treatment effect. There's fibrosis and sometimes uh, it will show a lot of mucin pores. That's very interesting also. And here are the positive nodes basically showing no treatment effect. So this w really carries the worst uh, prognostic uh, information. And uh, sometimes you have a little thing here, you know, as the histiocytes, as the residual tumor cells is just one cluster. Again, and since uh, all these are very important information, we do our, uh, we do PEN-CK on these and it's positive. And so then next question is how do you categorize this little one cluster? And if you use, if you use measurement, this is small, this is going to be probably ITC, isolated tumor cells. So do you use that term? for after new adjuvant chemotherapy because we all know that uh, uh, <coughs> lymph node staging including isolated tumor cells that's <coughs> staged as N0 but I positive. Then you have micromats that's positive that's N1 mic. So <coughs> how are these staged now after treatment? 
And so it's very clearly stated in the <coughs> WHO book <coughs> and in the, in the modern, in the guideline book uh, paper that any residual disease in the lymph node, including micromass and ITC, should be interpreted as node positive. So you don't cause those. Sometimes you have scattered some scattered tumor cells, you know, clearly a tumor bed, a fibrotic tumor bed in a, a, a lymph node don't call those ITC. You knew it was a positive node and now had treatment effect. And uh, in uh, uh, clinical trials, they just use less than two millimeter. So you can call those T1, N1 mic, uh, micromats, instead of calling them N0, because those are not N0 lymph nodes. And this is, again, very important uh, if it's part of a trial or research, because, <coughs> because this is different. You know, N0 is, uh, if the breast also don't have tumor, that's complete response, but this is not. And uh, so this is sometimes, you know, our my, uh, uh, colleagues still ask me, oh, I have kind of ITC. We don't call it ITC, right? I said, no. And this is very clearly stated also in the WHO book that anything after treatment in the lymph node is a positive node, so don't call them N0. And uh, so <laughs> I mentioned that you, you talk about number of nodes with meds, you talk, uh, talk about number of nodes with treatment effect, and also you tell them number of negative nodes showing treatment effect. Again, we incorporated those in our checklist so that you don't have to remember what to mention. You know, we were not completely uh, subspecialized at uh, uh, KU, so there are people who are not doing breast all the time, they forget. I mean, that's understandable. You know, I don't, I'm, I'm not up to date with, with the, um, you know, the colon cancer staging or whatever, so that it's good you, c you put it in, a, in, a, in your checklist so they know to mention it. So your number of nodes found, number of nodes showing treatment effect, so, so they are, you know, fill that up. And then again, you give uh, a kind of overall as assessment of treatment effect in the lymph nodes. And then we also, because of the marker assessment, we talk about you know, time between tumor removal and placement in formerly less than an hour or fixation time uh, for the marker assessment. So everything is included. I, I suspect the CAP probably will put out uh, a separate checklist soon because it's really different from the, from the uh, non-treated uh, breast. Okay, then a few words about predictive factors for response because uh, same, uh, you know, why some breast cancer, you know, have complete response and some don't. And that's always very intriguing. And for oncologists, you know, they like to have the feeling of success. So they, they would select their patient because now you know you can give it adjuvantly or neoadjuvantly. That doesn't affect survival. So, so they would like to, you know, give it to patients who have a more high likelihood to have a complete response. So in general, if you have a high nuclear grade, negative ER, high mitotic index, those tend to respond, be respond better. And there is a whole literature of molecular genomic predictors and uh, uh, out there. And this is a, a paper again showing you that usually negative ER or triple negative uh, 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 tumor tend to uh, respond better. This is a study actually done by Dr. Jamie Boone when she was a resident at, at KU. And this was her original graph and uh, she presented this and she actually got an, a research award. And you can tell that th the gray is a complete response. And clearly, triple negative tumor has a high complete response. So this is a group of patient uh, clinicians tend to give, uh, uh, give uh, a new adjuvant treatment. Instead, the other ones might just get it uh, adjuvantly. In her study, she also looked at KI67. KI67 is a very interesting uh, uh, marker. In this study, we showed that uh, you know, KI was actually not found to be associated with response to NACT, which is very controversial in literature. Some studies uh, you know, uh, agree with our result and some don't. And uh, it's the KI-667 is a routine use is not currently recommended by CAP or NCCN guideline. Be its main reason is because there is highly variable among labs and also is a 10% of the cutoff or 25% or 15%. There are no good guidelines. So, so it's not actually uh, currently recommended you know, to be part of the routine uh, protocol to, to run. And then there are nomograms. You know, oncologists love nomograms. And there are two, you know, they always use a little phone to calculate. 
And so there are two nomograms gram to try to predict uh, response. There's the MD Anderson nomogram, there is a European nomogram. Both they actually do very well for HER2 negative tumors, but they don't do so well with HER2 positive tumors. And there are other nomograms, again, very complicated mathematic equations. And, um, and uh, the oncologist knows which one to use. And uh, you know, luckily, we just provide them with, with whatever we have. And then, then the tumor-associated lymphocytes. And this is, was one of the original papers uh, published. And I was involved in one of the studies. And first, they sent us <coughs> the, the training set to look at those tumor. And they tell us how to evaluate the intratumoral lymphocytes. There are intratumoral lymphocytes, and there are the stromal lymphocytes. So we get trained. And then they send us the, the study uh, uh, slides. Those are pre-neoadjuvant treatment biopsy slides, and we are blinded to you know what the response it was, and I still don't know the you know it's a lot of effort. I don't know the result yet. So this is how this are the intratumoral lymphocytes. This is uh, you know the, when lymphocytes actually touch the epithelial cells. These are the lymphocytes in the stroma where the lymphocytes actually don't touch the tumor cells, and then these are the tumors without. Uh, lymphocytes. And it clearly shows if you have intratumoral lymphocytes, the, the complete response is pretty good, 30%. But if, if you have more than 60% lymphocytes in your tumor, the response is even better. So, so I, 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 I predict maybe pretty soon they would want us to provide that information in our report. Right now in biopsy, if I have really rich lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate, I do mention it because that might gears the uh, oncologist more towards giving the chemotherapy. And then like nowadays, if you give a talk on cancer, you cannot not talk about PDL one Have you guys been getting requests to do PDL one on lung cancer, melanoma, and all that? And it's coming for breast cancer. This is what the immunotherapy is about. So, so people wonder why, how cancer cells escape the, the immunosurveillance of the body. And one thing, one mechanism is that this is a T lymphocyte. This is a tumor cells. Tumor cells express PDL1, programmed uh, death ligand. And this, then this binds to the PD1. This binding has ne negatively regulate the cytotoxic effect of the lymphocytes. So that's what it is. So then if you treat these patients with <coughs> antibody against PDL1 or PD1, <coughs> hopefully to block this effect, then the lymphocytes can function normally again to try, you know, kill those uh, um, tumor cells. I think next week there is a free CAP webinar tell, uh, teaching us how to score the PDL1 in <coughs> lung cancer or cancer. This is a study, um, of course, <coughs> published in breast cancer. <coughs> Sorry. And it actually shows uh, here, if you don't have much uh, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. You don't have much PDL1. The red is PDL1, and uh, and also the you know they are basically you know suggesting I think you know more trials is going to come and uh, to do the pre uh, a new adjuvant study on that uh, uh, subject. So <coughs> in summary, that we play a critical role. We have to understand the clinical radiological pathologic correlation. So since, since complete response carries such a strong prognostic uh, implication, we need to make sure we always evaluate our specimen in a standardized way and do a thorough job. And, uh, and uh, then if there is residual tumor, we've got to give them the, the extent, the cellularity, the lymph node information, <coughs> because they all have clinical meanings. And again, you always use, that, use a standard approach and uh, as, as a, a part of, uh, you know, eventually for, 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 the, for the cancer treatment to advance, we have to help and participate in research. That's really where the science is. So we help them collect. We evaluate the response. And, uh, you know, I always contribute, always give them the sample. You know, of course, with all the, uh, everything is uh, uh, patient consent and IRB and all that. But, but I think we, we should always, as a pathologist, help with, with the research. Okay, that is it. This is uh, our hospital. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. I, I really enjoyed your talk. Thank you so much. Sure. And from what you said, it sounds to me 
that the gross examination of breast cancer tissue is almost important uh, yes. as a microscopic. Absolutely. Test. Is that true? Correct. Okay. Yes, and uh, you know, as a pathologist, uh, I think yeah, gross is as important as. And to 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 what extent do the faculty yes. get involved in the gross examination? Yeah, that's totally faculty dependent. Some faculty like to be there all the time, and okay. some don't. And. Uh, we have, I don't know about you, we have PAs now, and s sometimes we do, I mean, the PAs do a really good job. We teach them standardized, some, so sometimes we'd rather have PA do it and not the residents. <laughs> the residents <laughs> mess it up. <laughs> so, I know, but, you know, they need to, they need to learn, so. Okay, yeah. Uh, thank you for an excellent talk. Do you grow your yeah. Yeah, we do it uh, fresh. We gross it fresh. Yes. So we, we don't here, and I think I, I would like to change that. <laughs> I, I, think, I think it's much more efficient to gross them fresh, but it take, there's definitely a learning curve. A lot of people don't feel comfortable uh -huh. grossing uh, gross specimens fresh, but I think it's it much more efficient. The other point is that you have an X-ray machine in your lab, obviously. That also uh, has been shown to uh, decrease, you know, the number of. Uh, Sections that need to be taken. Yes. And uh, we, we don't have that here. Oh. So the PAs do a great job. They have, yeah. I guess, microscopic vision. They can find that <laughs> usually, but when they can't, it's really a time sink for them. They have to take the specimens down to radiology. Yeah. To have radiology. Uh, we, yeah, we used to be that had that. Then I tell you one thing you can get help if you have a strong breast surgeon. She can get you a Fextron in your, in your lab. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's how we, we they hired a, a hot shot breast surgeon from MD Anderson, and when we interviewed her, we said, can you get us as hot? <laughs> we need a Fextron. We used to do that. We have to run up, you know, x-ray the specimen, but now we have a Fextron. It's <coughs> tremendously, yeah. Oh, yeah, you have to have that. Yeah. So, obviously, taking a cytologic look at the uh, breast tissue is not a Mm -hmm. in cases where you have complete pathologic responses, <coughs> I guess skewed by the, the chemotherapy, but do you notice in those cases where there's residual DCIS, but uh, otherwise complete invasive pathologic response, do you notice is the grade of the DCIS generally consistent with what was seen on the previous biopsy, or is it primarily skewed by the, the, the chemotherapy? Yeah, trying to see what your observations have been. Yeah, correct, correct. Actually, a lot of times the DCIS nuclear grade went up. Yes, you, you know, I don't know the, it's just my uh, subjective uh, uh, observation is actually go, goes up. Is that how you? Yeah, yeah. well, and Molly would be the one to ask what yeah. she actually sees, but I'm just wondering from a standpoint too, like whether it's worth doing a, a clinical study to, I mean, look at other factors. And yeah. In those, in those cases of residual DCIS to see again, oh, yeah. you know, is it just the, the tibia treatment or is there something different about the grade? One would think that if it's residual uh -huh. and there's not, the invasive has been completely treated, that that would actually be a, potentially a lower grade or at least a lower proliferative index. Correct. You're right. You are, you, uh, now I see what you mean. Yes. Some, yeah, the nuclear grades actually a lot of times gone up. Yes. You're right. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Somebody else. Yeah. <laughs> so, regarding the moist question, do you actually report intraoperatory the status of the margins? Yes, we we do. All lumpectomy with the PA, we give them a gross margin measurement, and also the X-ray. You know, we all everyone is still the same. The radiologists also call them up with a gross margin calcification or whatever, <coughs> and surgeon can also see it uh, intraoperatively. So that significantly reduces the reop. Uh, uh, yes, we, the PAs, we always give them a gross margin assessment. It, I don't think it's actually very accurate all the time, but we do that. And, uh, I have a second question. So you said that uh, you report the, the size of the, the invasive cancer. Right? Correct. But for calculation of the residual cancer burden, you need the tumor lab. Correct. So you report both of them. Yeah, we do. We report both. And because for TNM staging, they use the largest contiguous tumor size. Yeah, but for tr calculating RCB, they actually want to extend. There's a lot of controversy about, as you alluded to. Yeah. And because when you have so much of the tumor size, you're going to have to do a lot of extensions. Yeah. 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 Ye
treatment response. Basically, you'll have clusters of tumor cells, then a bunch of fibrosis, and clusters of tumor cells. Yes. And it's just very challenging sometimes to say, okay, what is the biggest size of this tumor? Absolutely. You can't say that there's 30 tumors yeah. in a three centimeter area. <laughs> <laughs> I know, yes. So there's Yes. So there is some guidance. There is some common sense that goes into it. Absolutely. It is a challenge. Yes, absolutely. Sometimes we say is whoever hits the table the hardest gets to say what's the tumor size. <laughs> yeah. Uh, could you expand a little bit on your evaluation of uh, tumor infiltrating uh, lymphocytes? Do you yeah. make any effort to subcategorize the lymphocytes as to CD4? CDA positive or NK Yeah, positive. yeah, no, in, in the study I participated, we didn't. And I knew some place actually did. The, the, uh, the, they tried to categorize into, I see, they think they did CD4, CD8, and CD20. Yeah. But for us, we just did a morphologic uh, assessment. And uh, yeah. Yeah. So maybe I misunderstood. Did you say that the more lymphocytes, the more DL1 expression? Correct. So That's what, what the paper what said. What do you think is the cause and what do you think is the effect? I, I, I really don't. <laughs> because in, in, in leukemia models, uh, yeah. T cells producing interferon gamma very quickly upregulate the it, one in leukemic cells. Oh, okay. So I was wondering what is really the utility of doing the L1 staining? Yeah, I, I, it can be upregulated. Correct. I think, yeah, they are thinking about, you know, if in, it's not all, uh, you know, you, when you have more tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, you have more pdl one uh, uh, expression in the cancer cells and in the stromal cells. And, uh, you know, they are thinking maybe, you know, you could also use immunotherapy on those patients. I, I don't, right now. Yes, but the, the, the yeah. thinking is that only use it in cases that are pdl one positive. Yes. Whereas the argument would be that cases that are pdl one negative, negative, they can turn positive as soon as these cells get there. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. That's that's possible. But there are tumors which just don't have any, you know, lymphocytes. So. Yeah. But at least with Optiva, that's why it's not considered a companion diagnostic. It's considered a. They use some other PC term that basically indicates that you can use it to better understand any individual patient's outcome. Yeah. But it's not actually required. PDL1 expression is not actually required. Required to give, to give the drug. Correct. Um, there's been some Which data. Like yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that, that makes, uh, what is it? Right? I can't remember who like, owns Optiva, but that makes me very happy. But the results have been some data from, from all axonal genome sequencing that show that it's actually looking at mutational burden and the number of neo antigens that might actually correlate best with yeah. the response to immunotherapy. So yeah, okay. It, it may end up being that just looking for only that protein marker certainly is not going to be good enough. Yeah. For determining who, who best benefits from Okay. Well, yeah, I, I think the immunotherapy is, is exciting. It's coming. So. <laughs> okay. okay.